evening. I'm George Craw here with Rick Shannon Craw. Welcome to tonight's lecture, Habitable Exoplanets with Extremely Large Telescopes. 53 years ago, 600 million people watched the Apollo 11 astronauts take the first human steps on another world. Today, astronomer, astronomers know that our galaxy is teeming with planets, more numerous than the stars themselves. Tonight, we will explore a variety of avenues for advancing the state of art in exoplanet imaging, taking advantage of diverse tools ranging from computer uh, simulations to laboratory demonstrations to observations at the world's largest telescopes. Before we start, I would like to share a few details about the event tonight. For those online, we are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A at any time. Our conversation tonight will be moderated by Dr. Benjamin L. Gerard. Ben is a postdoctoral scholar here at UC Santa Cruz, working on exoplanet imaging and astro astronomical adaptive optics. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Colorado Boulder in physics and astrophysics in 2014, and graduate studies in physics uh, with a concentration in astronomy at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada in 2020. Ben, I hand the program over to you. Okay, thank you. So um, you all are in for a really great treat uh, tonight. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Jensen Clem uh, studies exoplanets or planets around other stars, um, as you may have seen in the title, but um, is a, a very rare um, scientist in both um, developing the technologies to um, make instruments that detect exoplanets uh, more sensitive as well as using those instruments to do um, science today uh, and so that is a very valuable perspective um, and rare in our uh, field so um, again you guys are certainly in for a treat um, dr attention clem uh, received her phd in 2017 uh, at caltech working with dr dimitri maway and then moved to UC Berkeley uh, as a postdoc and as a Miller Fellow, uh, working with uh, Dr. James Graham and others. And that was where, uh, like I said, she really sort of um, made her niche in two areas of both um, science applications of exoplanet imaging and um, uh, technology, developing new technologies. And um, with that, then uh, just recently in 2020, moved to UC Santa Cruz um, as faculty and is now an assistant professor there, leading an excellent uh, group, which I am a part of, that um, is developing new technologies to um, eventually try to image habitable exoplanets with the next, next generation of extremely large telescopes, which we'll uh, hear all about today. So um, with that, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Jensen Clem. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ben, for that kind introduction. And thank you to George and the organizers of the Carl Lecture Series for having me here today. Um, I'm very excited to share this topic with you. Um, so as Ben said, today I'm gonna to be talking about how we can directly image, and that means take pictures of um, habitable exoplanets, so planets that could potentially harbor life um, with the largest telescopes that we have um, here on Earth. Um, so I wanted to get started by emphasizing um, what a time of change this is in this field of exoplanet science. Um, we just saw the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, you'll be seeing the first science images from that space telescope shortly. Um, astronomers also just completed their sort of every 10 year planning phase. And one of the main conclusions from that planning phase called the decadal survey is that exoplanets and the large telescopes we need to study them are um, our communities of, of astronomers top priority today. So this time that we're in now in a period of vigorous exoplanet discovery and also trying to understand uh, what um, the contents of the atmospheres those planets are. I like to compare to the 60s and 70s um, when we first visited the planets in our own solar system um, up close and personal for the very first time. And here I'm showing uh, just a few of those very early images um, taken during flybys or orbits um, around these planets in our solar system. 
And what was really amazing about that time is that we started to be introduced to the planets in our solar system as true other worlds, not just points of light that you can see in the sky, but actual places that you can go and that you can study. And as Voyager, uh, the Voyager spacecraft receded from the Earth, it turned back around and it took this famous kind of funny looking composite family portrait of the planets in our solar system. The image that you see of the Earth on the left-hand side here is what Carl Sagan famously called the pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. And this was our picture of planets in the 60s and 70s. Today, our picture is very different. We've begun to place our solar system's planets in the context of the galaxy's full repertoire of planet formation, which it turns out um, is pretty diverse. So every colored point that you see on this figure here um, is an exoplanet. Um, and in fact, this figure is getting a little out of date because so many planets are discovered all the time. So each of these points represents a planet that's orbiting another star um, in our galaxy. So these are all representing other solar systems. Um, I've arranged this data to show them to you as a graph where we're looking at how massive um, each of these planets is. Uh, versus how far away are they from their star? So Earth is located 93 million miles away from our sun. That's defined as one astronomical unit. So you'll see Earth placed um, here at one AU. So you see that all of these exoplanets that astronomers have discovered um, only since the early 1990s, they look pretty different from the planets in our solar system. Even if you just look at how big are they? How far are they from their suns? We have many planets that are uh, many times the size of Earth that are much closer to their sun than Earth is to our sun or that are much farther away. And in fact, there's not really a lot of overlap between planets that astronomers have discovered orbiting other stars and the mass and separation of the planets in our solar system. And so now that we have stepped into this era of exoplanet discovery just in the last 20 to 30 years, the next chapter of this story is going to be discovering exoplanets that have a lot in common um, with our solar system's planets and for whom we can search for signs of life on those planets. So what are all the colors on this plot? So um, what I'm showing you is different ways that these exoplanets have been discovered. So the very earliest exoplanets, uh, the ones that are plotted in blue here, um, were discovered in an indirect way. Um, so astronomers pointed their telescopes um, at bright stars in the sky. Um, and like a, uh, similar to a prism, um, they broke up that starlight by color. And what did they see? Well, if you imagine a planet orbiting another star, um, it's not just the planet orbiting the star. Um, the planet is also tugging gravitationally on the star. And so in a very small way, the star is also orbiting what we call the center of mass between the star and the planet. And so when we look at that star, we see it sometimes moving towards us and sometimes moving away from us. And so just as uh, an ambulance siren uh, sounds one way when it's moving towards you, and then it sounds lower when it's moving away from you, we could monitor how uh, the star's colors change as it orbits that center of mass with the planet. So many, many planets have been discovered with this, what we call an indirect method, because we're not seeing the planet itself. Um, what we're observing is the planet's effect on the star. Um, we call this the Doppler or the radial velocity method. The other one that I want to address um, is the transit method. So these are the planets plotted um, in red on this figure. Um, the transit method is in the news pretty frequently. Um, so some of you might already be familiar with this. Now, the way this works is if we happen to be lined up just right with another solar system, we can monitor how bright is this star over time. And if we're lucky, we can see the drop in how bright the star appears to us when a planet crosses in front of the face of that star. So this doesn't happen very often because you have to be aligned just right, but when it does happen, it tells us something about how big that planet is relative to its star. And it also tells us how long the orbit is if we watch over multiple transits. 
Now, what's even more exciting about uh, transiting exoplanets is that it gives us some way to study the physics and the chemistry of those planets' atmospheres. And that's what I mean when I talk about our new era of exoplanet characterization. And how does that work? Well, if you imagine that I observed um, this transit event, so the planet crossing in front of the star, at different colors or different wavelengths, um, if at that wavelength, the planet's atmosphere absorbs the starlight that's passing through it, it's filtering through that planet's atmosphere on the way to us, the observer, well then that planet appears to be larger um, if the atmosphere is absorbing more starlight. If that planet's atmosphere is not absorbing starlight, then the transit signature will appear smaller. So this method is how we've gotten our first glimpses into the makeup or the contents of a planet's atmosphere. Now, this is a very challenging technique because you can probably imagine we're getting a lot of light from the star and very little of that light is being affected by the planet's atmosphere. Um, also the Earth's atmosphere, um, if you were to observe Earth as a transiting planet, um, hugs the surface of the Earth. Um, and so these are very small effects um, that we would need to observe and very hard to disentangle um, with the star's um, spectrum or the star's colors itself. So wouldn't it be easier if you could separate the light from the planet, from the light from the star, and observe the planet in that direct fashion, rather than observing only the planet's effect on the starlight? And that is what we aim to do uh, when we directly image a planet. So in this figure, the orange dots represent a small group of planets that we have actually been able to take pictures of, um, those of us in astronomy who work in this area. And you'll notice a few things about this small grouping of planets right away, aside from the fact that there aren't very many uh, of these planets compared to those discovered through other methods. First of all, they're all located quite far from their star. Most of them are farther from their star than Jupiter is from our sun. Also, you'll see that they're quite massive. In fact, they're more massive um, than Jupiter, those that we've discovered so far. So they really have very little in common with the Earth in these senses. And the reason for this is purely a bias um, as to our observations. It's very challenging for us to take pictures of planets that are located very close to their suns and which are very um, low mass like the Earth and which are very old like the Earth. The Earth is billions of years old. But nonetheless, I wanna show you what some of these planets look like. So what does it mean to take a picture of a planet? Well, in some ways it's exactly what it sounds like. So this is a sequence of images taken over the course of many years. You can see the year on the lower left here as it passes by. And what you're looking at is data. Um, this is actually a composite of data from two different telescopes. Um, those telescopes had um, what at the time that they were taking this data were some of the most advanced systems for taking pictures of exoplanets in existence. So in a way that I'll explain shortly, um, the light from the central star, so from these planet sun, has been mostly blocked out. You see a little bit you know, of that starlight kind of leaking out around the edges. But now it's revealed to us that there are four planets orbiting this star. Now, these planets, they might kind of uh, appear visually uh, like the planets in our solar system, but they're very different. They're many times more massive um, than Jupiter. They're located far in the outer reaches of their solar system. And they're also very young. Um, so what we're seeing is different than if, if you were to look outside tonight um, and see Jupiter, for example, what you're seeing is sunlight reflected by Jupiter back into your eyes. What we're seeing here is different. We're actually observing these planets at long, long wavelengths. And because these planets are so young, they formed so recently, they're still grow glowing red hot um, at those long wavelengths. So we're seeing them uh, still with their fiery heat of formation. So this is a very special set of circumstances, but what makes this so valuable to astronomers is that once we have this point of light, we can disperse that light into a spectrum. Now, the ultimate goal of this field of exoplanet imaging 
is to one day directly image a planet like the Earth, to disperse its light into a spectrum, and to see evidence for life. So if you were to take a spectrum of the Earth, what would it look like? So in this figure, um, I'm showing how much sunlight the Earth reflects as a function of color or wavelength. And all of these symbols here are showing you how we could identify different parts of that planet's atmosphere. So you can see that we have all kinds of signatures of water of H2O in this figure. Uh, we have oxygen uh, features all over the spectrum. We have ozone features all over the spectrum. And there are different components um, that indicate to us that there must be um, something like uh, playing the role of vegetation um, on this planet's atmosphere. So this is the holy grail. This is what we're going after. We want to be able to make a measurement like this for another planet. So why is this so hard? Um, what's it going to take to go from directly imaging the small group of massive, distant, young, hot planets to observing all the way down to this kind of planet, the low mass planets that are rocky, they're not gaseous like Jupiter. They might be billions of years old like the Earth, and they're close enough to their star that they're warm enough to potentially host light. So what I'm gonna be talking about um, for the rest of this talk is the technology that we need to build to get us there, to bridge this gap between the planets that we've currently imaged to planets, to directly imaging planets like the Earth. So to explain how this technology works, what its limitations are, and how we might overcome those limitations, I wanna just go back to basics for a moment and think about what it looks like to take a picture of a star. So if you consider a star, of course, it's emitting light uniformly in all directions, uh, approximately. And light itself is a wave. So you can consider an analogy where you take a pebble and you drop that pebble into a pond and you see those circular ripples coming out from the pebble. If you were to draw a line on the crest of one of those ripples, uh, we would call that in astronomy a wavefront. So just like the ripples coming out from a pebble, the starlight is emitting, or the star is emitting light waves in all directions. And we can draw little circles, or really these would be more similar to spherical shells to indicate where the crests of those light waves are. And we call those crests wave fronts. Okay, so we've got these uniform wave fronts um, being emitted by the star. Stars are so far away, however, that by the time those wave fronts reach an observer here on Earth, they're so stretched out that they're basically flat. Okay, so now we can think about a flat wave front coming to our eyes or our telescopes. If you were to then try to form an image or take a picture of this star using a space telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, what would you see? Well, you wouldn't see an infinitely tiny point of light. Um, because light is a wave, when it encounters this telescope's mirror, it's bending, it's diffracting around this mirror and the optics inside the telescope. And so instead of seeing an infinitely tiny point, um, we instead see what we refer to as a diffraction pattern. Um, and that's what you see here in this image. Um, this is something we call either a diffraction pattern or uh, an airy disk. And this just shows that every time you take a picture, even of a star um, that's, that is very far away from your point of view, it's not just one point of light, that light gets spread out just because of the nature of the light waves themselves as they encounter your telescope. And the size um, of the image that you formed of the star is related to the wavelength um, that you're observing in. Uh, so red, green, blue, infrared, et cetera. Um, that's represented by the Greek letter lambda. And then D is the diameter of your telescope. So the bigger a telescope you have, the smaller and smaller um, that central core of your image of the star becomes. So that gives you a clue as to why those of us who want to directly image planets like large telescopes, because the smaller we can make our 
image of the star, the closer in we're able to find exoplanets. Now, the other advantage of a large telescope is that you collect a lot of light, so you can see planets that are very faint. So it's those two things um, that drive us always towards larger telescopes in this field. Okay, now uh, the Hubble Space Telescope um, is only a fraction of the size in terms of the size of its light collecting mirror compared with telescopes we have on the ground. Um, even the new James Webb Space Telescope, um, its mirror is about six and a half meters wide, whereas today the largest telescope um, uh, on the ground is 10 meters um, across. So because it's so expensive to launch large, um, heavy, complicated um, telescopes into space, we always will have larger telescopes on the ground than we will in space, at least for the foreseeable decades. So it's very much worth our while to uh, directly image planets from the ground where we have our biggest telescopes. So what happens then? So now the star's light, the star's wavefronts, has to encounter the Earth's atmosphere. So the atmosphere, um, we can think about it in many ways, but what's relevant here is that the atmosphere is made up of many pockets of air, and those pockets of air have different temperatures. So when the starlight is traveling through the atmosphere, it encounters those pockets of air. And when you go through air of different temperatures, that actually changes um, the speed at which light is propagating through that medium. So it can slow down the light um, depending on the temperature of those air pockets. So now that we've gone through the Earth's atmosphere, instead of having these, th these perfect light waves coming towards us, now we have these kind of twisted and distorted light waves or distorted uh, wave fronts as we call them. So now if I were to take a picture of this star um, with a telescope on the ground, I wouldn't see that perfect diffraction pattern, that perfect airy disk whose size is defined by your wavelength of observation divided by the size of my telescope. Instead, I see this tremendous mess, which is represented here on the slide. Um, and that tremendous mess changes with time because the Earth's atmosphere is constantly roiling and changing. It's not staying the same. So if I were to take a sort of long exposure, if I were to stare at the star for a long time and sort of combine all my images of that star, I would see this enormous blur. And the size of that blur is no longer determined by how big my telescope is. Instead, it's determined by the sort of the characteristic size of these air pockets, which is called R0 here. And so now, you know, we're still gathering a lot of light. That's an advantage of having a big telescope, but we're not taking advantage of that large telescope's ability to take a small constrained image of that star. So how do we get around this? So this is what a technology called adaptive optics is designed to do. It's designed to undo the distortions of these wavefronts so that we can go back to taking that beautiful diffraction limited airy disk. So how does adaptive optics work? So imagine that I have sort of attached to my telescope, sort of off to the side. Um, I have a, a piece of equipment um, that's gonna do my adaptive optics correction. So if you imagine the light uh, that's kind of coming in from the telescope, uh, you can imagine the telescope is being off the screen. Uh, it gets um, diverted um, to your adaptive optics instrument. And that the wave fronts or the, the um, surfaces of the waves um, of that starlight have been distorted. So what happens in an adaptive optic system is we bounce that light off of a special type of mirror. Now this isn't the, the main mirror of your telescope. This is a smaller mirror that is just inside um, your adaptive optics piece of equipment. Okay, so this mirror is special because we can change the shape of that mirror. So if you imagine um, that you had a really flexible bathroom mirror and behind your bathroom mirror, you put a bunch of uh, motors that could push and pull the surface, then somebody who was standing looking in that mirror, it would feel like a fun house to them as you were pushing and pulling um, the mirror from behind and, and changing the shape of the surface. So that's what we're doing on a much finer scale. This is a piece of equipment that we call a deformable mirror, naturally enough. Um, so you can imagine a device that is maybe only um, an inch or a couple inches across 
Um, it has motors or actuators on the back side of it that push and pull its shape. Um, but unlike a funhouse mirror, it's only pushing and pulling the shape by very small amounts. So by, for example, um, micrometers, um, so very small. So the deformable mirror is what allows us to undo these wavefront distortions. Um, by putting um, the exact shape corresponding to those distortions on the deformable mirror, well then we can create these perfect flat parallel light waves bouncing off that mirror. So now you could wonder, okay, that sounds great, but how would I know what shape to give that deformable mirror? So that's where the second component of an adaptive optic system comes in. We call it the wavefront sensor, and its job is to tell you in what way is the light distorted so that you can then tell the deformable mirror how to deform. So oftentimes, um, astronomers will say, well, I'm only interested in, uh, for example, the, the red or the infrared light. Um, that's where I want to take pictures of my planets. So I'll send that red light uh, down to, say, the camera that we're going to use to take our science pictures, but I'm not using the blue light. So I'll take some of that blue light and I'll send it to our wavefront sensor. Um, so how would you use a wavefront sensor? How could this work to tell you about the shape of those wavefront distortions? Well, there are a many, there are many, many ways of doing this, um, but I'll give one example. So imagine that you uh, take your beam of light that you've collected from the star and you direct it towards a grid of tiny lenses. So if you then put a camera behind that grid of tiny lenses, you would get a grid of points. Seems simple enough. Now, what would happen if instead of having these perfectly flat wavefronts, if there were distortions? Well, then the light waves that were hitting each lens in your grid, those waves are slightly tilted in one of many ways. And so when a tilted beam of light hits a lens, then the point of light that you that you focus behind the lens, that also moves a little bit. So for a distorted wavefront, for example, from passing through the atmosphere, will move, uh, deviate these spots from their perfect grid placement. And by measuring how much those spots have moved relative to a perfect grid, we can say how much was the light tilted and in what direction was it tilted. And that's one way that we reconstruct what those distortions were to our wavefront. And then we can uh, read that information with a computer and then command the deformable mirror to move accordingly. So in a nutshell, that's how an adaptive optic system works. Uh, we sense the distortions introduced by the Earth's atmosphere uh, to that starlight with a wavefront sensor, and then we correct them with a deformable mirror. Now, if your goal is to take a picture of an exoplanet, you have to go a few steps further. So um, what you see in the right-hand side of this figure are two pieces of equipment that we use to then block out the light from the star so that we can see the pictures of the planets. So this is really a two-step process for us. So first we have to undo the distortions to the starlight to bring it back to that perfect diffraction limited airy disk shape. And then we need to suppress that starlight so we can see planets next to it. So the starlight suppression happens um, oftentimes in two or even more stages. So at the first stage, um, you bring the light to a focus and you introduce what we call a coronagraph mask. Um, if any of you have ever seen a total solar eclipse before, like the 2017 one that we could see from the continental US, um, you have experienced coronagraphic observations. So when the moon uh, passed um, between us and the sun during the total solar eclipse, um, it was blocking out the, most of the light from the sun and uh, if you recall, or if you've seen pictures, you could see the sun's corona or this sort of halo around the sun. So astronomers uh, early in the 20th century said, I don't wanna wait for an eclipse. I wanna make my own what they called a corona graph. So a piece of equipment um, that would act like the moon, it would block out the light from the sun so they could see the sun's corona. We still use that same terminology. So in our coronagraphic mask, um, you can imagine that you have formed an image of your star and you just put a little dark dot right in the center um, of that light. Um, or you could get clever um, with exactly how to design the shape and uh, how transmissive that dot is. Um, that's the first step, a coronagraphic mask. Uh, 
Now, the second thing we do is um, we uh, sort of use another lens. We make those light rays parallel again. Um, and what we find is that there's, there's um, oftentimes some starlight left over kind of at the edges uh, when you bring those light rays parallel again. Um, and we use what we call a Leo mask. It's named after an astronomer named Bernard Leo, who was working on early coronagraphs. And this is just a ring or a washer shaped mask that blocks out some of that final light right around the edges. So now, finally, at long last, we can form an image on our science camera and we can start to take pictures of exoplanets now that we've corrected the starlight distortions and we have suppressed that starlight. Okay, so that is the technology that we use for exoplanet imaging in a nutshell. But before I was showing you, we've only found a handful. We've only been able to directly image a handful of exoplanets. And those planets are kind of the low hanging fruit that we're able to see. They're big, they're hot, they're bright, they're far from their stars. So clearly this doesn't work perfectly, right? So let me explain to you all the ways in which it doesn't work perfectly. So first of all, we only have so many motors to distort our deformable mirror. And so that means that if your wave front um, has very small uh, or fine spatial scale aberrations, we can't really correct those with a deformable mirror. Uh, we don't have infinite motors um, to control its surface. So, okay, so that's problem number one. Um, another big problem um, that I'm gonna tell you more about though, is you have a time delay of when you sense what the shape of the wavefront is, and then when you actually control the shape of the wavefront with a deformable mirror. So I have to take some time to collect light um, on my wavefront sensing camera, and then it takes my computer, you know, some finite amount of time uh, to get the information off of that camera to do some computations and then tell the deformable mirror to move. So what kind of time delays are we talking about here? Um, this is maybe one to a few milliseconds. So that doesn't seem like much, um, but that is plenty of time for the Earth's atmosphere to evolve um, in a way that makes a big difference for how well your adaptive optics system works. And how big of a difference? Well, now I'm gonna show you, uh, instead of um, the sort of beautiful final images of, of exoplanets that I have been showing you, I'm gonna show you some nearly raw data uh, from a, a, an instrument for direct imaging. So there's a lot going on in this image, um, but what we see here is a picture taken with adaptive optics with that system of coronagraphs in place. And so um, you can ignore these four little spots here. Those were introduced on purpose just to help us with calibration. But aside from those spots, what we would have liked to have seen uh, is very little light anywhere in this image. All of this is starlight that managed to escape our adaptive optic system and it escaped our coronagraph. And now it's going all over our image in such a way that it would be hard for us to see a planet on top of that leaked starlight. So this is bad news. And furthermore, you'll notice that the starlight, it's not smeared over the image uniformly. Instead, it has this kind of characteristic bow tie or what we often call butterfly shape. And what's going on here is that the wind that night was blowing particularly hard in a certain direction. And because of that time lag in our adaptive optic system, we were doing a pretty poor job at uh, correcting the starlight that corresponded to that particular direction of the wind. So this is the concrete consequence of the time delay in an adaptive optic system. So something that my group um, here at UC Santa Cruz and then in collaboration uh, with the adaptive optics team at Keck Observatory, something we've been working hard on over the last few years is saying, well, I can't make my adaptive optics system run infinitely fast. Um, so there's always gonna be some time delay, even if it's small. So what I'd really like to do is collect a long history of measurements of the wavefront shape and then try to use that long history of data to predict uh, what will the wavefront shape be one time delay, for example, one millisecond into the future. So this is called predictive wavefront control. Um, so we're trying to say, can I use my past history 
of measurements of the wavefront to predict the next state of the wavefront. So that's how we want to compensate for that time delay. Now, oftentimes people are surprised to learn that this is even possible. You might think, isn't atmospheric turbulence just completely random? Like, why, why would you expect to be able to predict it? Um, but the answer is that the atmosphere uh, tends to move over modest timescales in a fairly predictable way. In other words, there's structure in the chaos. So if you imagine that this um, up here, we're seeing kind of a visual representation of the atmospheric turbulence as it evolves over time. It looks pretty random in that representation, um, but actually this is composed of many different layers of atmospheric turbulence, each, oops, let me play that again, each of which is translating uh, at its own velocity. So this isn't random, really what we're seeing is sort of pockets of turbulence that are moving across our telescope's field of view. And so it's that kind of predictability that allows us to do this work. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some results from this work. Um, these are pretty hot off the presses. This is um, what we were doing just in the last year or so. Um, and this work was uh, led by another wonderful postdoctoral scholar um, here at UC Santa Cruz named Dr. Micah Van Coten. And what uh, Micah and our, and our team with the Keck Observatory Adaptive Optics System did is they turned on the adaptive optics system, they put in the coronagraph, and then they measured, okay, how, how dark did I make it? <laughs> how, how good of a job did I do at suppressing the light from the star? And the way that we um, represent that in our field is as uh, how much fainter of a planet compared to a star would I have been able to see um, as a function of how far from the star am I looking. So you can imagine it's, it's sort of easier to see something faint if it's farther away from the star. Um, so usually our sort of detectability gets better uh, far away from the star, but then close in it's harder because that's where a lot of the light is kind of leaking out from behind that coronagraph in the ways that I was just showing you. So this is what we call a contrast curve. And this is um, a big indispensable tool um, in our line of work here. So what Micah did is she turned everything on in its sort of standard configuration that we would use night after night. That's what's shown by the teal line here. And then she turned on our brand new predictive um, control system for our adaptive optics system. And what she saw was the purple line below. So what she finds is that uh, sort of depending on how far away you are from the star, uh, we could see planets that are two to three times fainter uh, if we turn on predicted control um, compared to if we just used our regular system. So this was really exciting for us. This was the first time um, anyone had been able to really show how important is predictive control um, for this sort of exoplanet imaging application. And this was really representing the first test we were able to do at a real telescope using this method. So I would say this, this more represents the worst that predictive control can do, not, not the best that it can do. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer questions about where we wanna go next with this work later in the Q&A session. Okay, so that is how uh, we are working to address that time delay error in an adaptive optic system. But there are more errors, and there are more things we can do about those errors. Another big one um, that impacts exoplanet imaging and that we'll need to fix, um, no matter how big the telescope is, is that um, all of the different lenses and mirrors that you use uh, to bring the light to your science detector, um, all of those might have imperfections in them. You can imagine uh, they might be smudged or scratched in some way or have dust on them. And no matter how careful you are, there's always gonna be some kind of imperfection in those optics. And because we have to include some of these lenses and mirrors in order to form an image um, of our exoplanets, um, and those have to occur after our wavefront sensor, um, our wavefront sensor isn't going to be able to see the effects of any of the distortions introduced by these lenses and mirrors. Um, so unfortunately, um, we will simply be left in our final science image um, with a lot of artifacts that are just due to those distortions that the wavefront sensor can't see. And so your deformable mirror um, in this sort of standard configuration wouldn't know to correct. So 
I want to tell you about an exciting uh, method that our group, um, led by Ben Girard, who um, provided the introduction at the beginning of this talk, has been leading to try to fix this problem, um, as well as many other challenges in adaptive optics. So I mentioned to you earlier <clears throat> that sort of part two of the coronagraphic system here is called this Leo plane mask. And that this mask has sort of a, a disc um, or a washer shape. So let's take a closer look um, at this sort of washer shaped piece of equipment. So when we put this into our beam, what happens is we've kind of blocked out the edges of that starlight, as I was talking about earlier. But what would happen if on purpose, you poked just a little hole um, in that washer mask? Well, then you would let some of the starlight uh, through that little hole and it would interfere with, I would, it would produce this interference pattern with the main part of the starlight <clears throat> that already passed through the center, excuse me. So um, for those of you who um, took uh, physics class um, in recent decades, you might remember something called Young's double slit experiment, where light was allowed to pass through two slits on a screen, and then that light interfered with itself at the location of that uh, screen, and then you, you see the sort of wave interference pattern. So that's similar to what's going on here. We are interfering the starlight with itself, and so we're creating these interference fringes. Um, which turns out that we can use the computer um, to process um, this fringe data, and we can use it to make a second computation of how was the wavefront distorted. And now we're going to be able to include any distortions that the lenses and mirrors that occurred after the adaptive optics system uh, introduced. We can also um, sense any sort of leftover errors that for whatever reason the original wavefront sensor uh, wasn't able to correct. And then we can go back and tell the deformable mirror, hey, you missed these errors. Um, you better take on the slightly different shape so that we can correct those. So what would this look like in practice? Um, well, this is a device uh, that Ben designed. And uh, what you're seeing is down here, this is kind of what would be represented by that washer shape. Um, here we've turned on a laser in the lab to represent the starlight. So you see that little ring of red light down here. That's kind of representing the effect of that washer shape. But now we've done something special. We've also poked a hole um, in this mask. So, uh, and also we've designed a special coronagraphic mask that moves as much of the starlight as possible onto that hole. So that finally, when we put this light on our science camera, we can produce uh, these bright interference fringes that allow us to measure the wavefront. Okay, so Ben over the last few years has been hard at work in demonstrating um, that this technique um, can really work on a laboratory test bed that we have here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, it's called SEAL, the Santa Cruz Extreme AO Lab. And I hope you can enjoy the local flavor of our logo here. It shows an elephant seal uh, with some aberrated wavefronts and then some flat wavefronts there. Um, and so this was a sort of tabletop lab demonstration. And um, as part of our SEAL lab, um, we have all of these different components that I've been showing you. Uh, we have a deformable mirror. In fact, we have multiple deformable mirrors. Um, we have a whole, every type of wavefront sensor that we can think of. Um, we have different types of coronagraphs that we can use. Um, and so as part of that system, um, Ben built this special type of coronagraph where we move some of the uh, light onto that sort of hole poked in the mask. Um, and then we create these interference fringes. Uh, we can measure the, the um, shape of the wavefront again, and we can make the appropriate corrections. Um, so what this sequence of images is showing is, first of all, we have our kind of uh, fake or simulated atmospheric turbulence that we're, we're um, playing onto our deformable mirror to create some of that residual turbulence. And then way on the, on the left-hand side over here, you see our science image. So this might look kind of messy um, at first glance. Um, we have sort of our, our starlight, which is actually um, laser light. It's sort of going everywhere in the image. There are all kinds of distortions that we're looking to correct. Uh, but what you can see is that uh, when Ben starts this extra, this added correction um, based on those interference fringes, that suddenly he creates this very clean looking 
sort of backward C shape region um, in our science image here. And you can actually start to see um, the separate point of light here. So you, now you can see it. Uh, this is our simulated planet light. So it's laser light coming from a slightly different angle. So we use that to simulate um, a faint planet. Uh, so we're really excited by these results. Um, they're just getting published now and, and will be um, published in even more advanced form soon. Um, but this is a method um, that we think will be very impactful at our current observatories and our future observatories because it helps us correct um, those last bits of wafer and errors that really make a difference for exoplanet imaging. Okay, now the third topic that I want to tell you about. So we've talked about um, predicting the wavefronts shape. We've talked about uh, correcting what were at first these uncorrectable errors that were introduced after your main AO system. Um, but now I want to tell you about um, the errors that are introduced because your exoplanet imaging system is attached to a real telescope. So this is a picture of um, the Keck telescope in Hawaii. Um, this telescope is a total of 10 meters across, so you can see a person reflected in the mirror here for, for scale, kind of. Um, and this telescope is not, the mirror is made out of not just one single piece of glass, um, but in order to make the mirror lighter um, so that it can keep its shape better, it's actually made out of these hexagonal mirror segments. Um, and there are, there are, you know, 36 or so of these segments. Now, what would happen if the positions of these segments weren't quite what you wanted? Uh, what if some of the segments were just slightly offset relative to their neighbors? Um, and maybe that's because uh, you can only you know, do a, a, a realignment of your segmented telescope mirror so often, and maybe over time, those segments just drift a little bit. They get a little bit out of alignment. Now, most of the time, even if you were using adaptive optics, this would not make any difference to your science images. It would be a tiny effect. But when you're trying to take images of very faint exoplanets, it turns out everything is important. <laughs> and this is an effect um, that can also be make or break uh, for your ability to see extremely faint planets. Okay, now the problem is that um, when you have these uh, little segment offsets from each other, um, it creates these very sharp um, boundaries between uh, a wavefront that was distorted in one way and then a wavefront that was distorted in a slightly different way. And it's hard for us with our sort of standard adaptive optics system to both measure what those distortions were, and it's also hard for us to correct them with our deformable mirrors. Um, if you imagine that we have this sort of a continuous mirror sheet and it's being pushed and pulled from behind, that motion is pretty different from just a one single hexagon that got moved relative to a different hexagon. So these misalignments, they're hard for us to measure, they're hard for us to correct even when we do measure them. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we can look back uh, to the 1930s and 40s uh, when uh, a scientist named Fritz Zernike um, was interested in taking pictures of cells with his microscope. And his problem was that his cells were mostly made out of water and they were in water. And so when he took a picture of these cells, which is an example is on the top image here, they were mostly transparent. So it was hard for him to kind of get a, enough contrast for him to see, um, for example, the organelles or the different components in those cells. So he came up with this um, optical system that allowed him to improve um, his contrast. So you can see that in the lower image, that's it's a lot easier to see the details um, inside these cells. And what he did was very simple. He said, okay, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna bring the light to a focus, but instead of putting a camera there, which is what we would oftentimes do when we bring light to a focus, um, he introduced a little piece of equipment um, that introduces a little bump right at the very center of the focus. So what that was doing was delaying the light, so creating his own wavefront distortion right at the center of the light. And 
in a way, um, this is similar to the interference fringes that I was showing you a few, a few slides ago, because now he said, okay, now that I've introduced this bump, um, if I form an image again, I have uh, created sort of these two offset pieces of light, and now I'm going to interfere them with each other. And what he found is that when he kind of looked at this particular uh, way that he had interfered the light, that improved his contrast, and he was happy. Um, it turns out you can, again, extract um, what the distortions to that light wave were uh, just based on this optical setup. Okay, so that's a roundabout way of saying that this device, which is named after him, it's called the Zerniki Wavefront Sensor. Um, this is another way of measuring distortions to the shape of the wavefront. And it's a way that it doesn't care that you have these sort of uh, sudden discontinuities. So uh, this is really good at sensing the kinds of um, errors you get in your optical system um, that are just based on the um, distortions introduced by the telescope mirror itself. Okay, so uh, we got together uh, here at UC Santa Cruz um, with a bunch of colleagues. Um, they were located at Caltech down in Pasadena. They were at the Jet Propulsion Lab, part of NASA, at Keck Observatory. And we said, all right, we want to install um, this special type of Zernike wavefront sensor as part of our Keck Observatory adaptive optics system. And then, just as a test, we want to deliberately offset a few of those mirror segments and see if we can measure those using our Zernike wavefront sensor. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and this result is also hot off the presses, just published uh, maybe two months ago or so now. So what we did is we took three segments of the primary mirror and we intentionally moved them um, to a different uh, position as they were supposed to be. And this is an example of an image that we took using this Zernike style wavefront sensor. And you can immediately see, just like you got better contrast of those, um, micro of those microscope images of cells, we're getting this fabulous contrast showing us um, that these three segments were pushed. So we were excited about this because this was a really um, the first time that anybody had used the special type of wavefront sensor with a telescope on the ground to tell you about how well your segmented telescope was aligned. So this is an important tool, not only for ground-based telescopes, um, but also for telescopes in space. Um, so right now, um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is also made out of a similar style of hexagonal segments, um, they have spent many months, the team that runs the James Webb Space Telescope, has spent many months trying to get the alignment of those segments just right. And it involves a lot of sort of motion and measurements and re-measurements of those segments. But for the next generation of space telescopes and the next generation of large ground-based telescopes, almost all of which will have these segmented mirrors, because that's the only way we can make mirrors light enough um, at such large sizes. They would all benefit from the Zernike wavefront sensor um, as a very uh, easy way for them to say, hey, how aligned are my segments? Um, if they're not aligned, how far off are they from being aligned? So then I can tell them to go to the correct place. So now that we've shown that our new Zernike wavefront sensor at Keck can sense uh, these bits that are out of phase, our next plan um, is to set this up so that we can be running the Zernike wavefront sensor at the same time as somebody is doing their exoplanet imaging observations, so that whenever we see a segment get out of phase, we can whack it back down again, because now we have the right tools to do that. Okay, so these three areas of technology development that I've described, the predictive wavefront control, um, the measuring the residual wavefront errors, um, using your science light itself, and the correction of the segment offsets from the telescope's mirror itself. These are three of the technologies that we're going to need to actually take pictures of Earth-like planets with the next generation of ground-based telescopes. Let me show you another representation of kind of what's at stake with these technology development efforts. So this is kind of a fancy way of showing you another what we call a contrast curve. So here, this figure is showing you uh, how bright is the planet compared to its star, and then how far is that planet from its sun. So it's similar to the figure that I showed you earlier in that sense. Each of these dots 
uh, represent um, a computer simulation of what you know, different types of planets would look like. Um, so here the green um, indicates Earth-like planets um, and the yellow indicates sort of Neptune-like planets and the red indicates Jupiter-like planets. So it's showing you all these different types of planets that you might be able to see. Now up in the corner here, we see the, the contrast curves or sort of the performance curves representative of today's equipment. So what's pretty apparent in this figure is that we're not able to see any of these simulated planets. Now, what this figure is showing is what if instead of looking at those um, extremely young and hot glowing planets, what if we looked at those planets just as our eyes do the solar system planets uh, in terms of the light that they reflected from their sun? So we can't see any, any such planets um, with the current generation um, of instruments um, that I've just described. Okay, now what if I simply took a sort of current standard instrument um, and I just put it on a bigger telescope? So for instance, our next generation of large ground-based telescopes will be um, instead of 10 meters in their mirror's diameters, uh, 25 to 40 meters. Okay, so if I put these on a bigger telescope, I can see fainter things. Um, I can see closer in to the star. So that's what this top black line is showing you. If I put one of today's exoplanet imaging uh, adaptive optics chronograph instruments just on a bigger telescope, you can see that doesn't get you very far. We're not overlapping with these exciting populations of planets that we would like to see. But now, what if you were to implement all of these different technologies that I just told you about, the predictive control, the, seg the segmented telescope phasing, the correction of the residual errors and more? Well, it's the best as we can figure it out, that would give you something like the lower black line here. Now this isn't perfect, there's room for that to improve, but you're starting to see that that would allow you to image planets like the Earth represented by these green dots. Now you might wonder, how do these ground-based telescopes fit in with the next generation of planned space telescopes? So these blue lines over here represent kind of the performance curves of some uh, planned and sort of speculative space telescopes. And what's great about these is that because they don't have to contend with atmospheric turbulence, they can see uh, quite faint planets. But because they're not as large as the telescopes on the ground, they can't look in as close to their star because again, you can only look in as close as the wavelength uh, that you're observing divided by the size of your telescope. So these smaller telescopes can only get you so far. Furthermore, getting these most exciting telescopes into space is probably a 40 year, 20 to 40 year endeavor. These next generations of ground-based telescopes, however, are coming um, in the next 10 years. Um, so this is a really exciting time where um, in our field, we're in a race to invent the technologies that'll allow us to move from this sort of current performance curve on a larger telescope down as low as we can drive um, this performance curve so that we can see planets like the Earth. We can uh, see them as separate point sources from their host stars and disperse their light into a spectrum. Okay, and with all of that as hopefully seed for your questions, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to the adaptive optics and exoplanet imaging teams at UC Santa Cruz um, and also at the Keck um, Adaptive Optics headquarters. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions. Great, excellent, very exciting and lots of questions indicating that. So um, I will, uh, as the privilege of the moderator, um, ask the technical questions, which sure. uh, are exciting and particularly relevant to a lot of things you've just talked about. And as I'm doing that, encourage uh, people to ask more technical questions. So. Um, Here's a really interesting one. The adaptive optic system is controlled computationally. Its weakness appears to be largely mechanical. What portions of the downstream optics, masks, etc., cetera, uh, cannot be replaced by some set of computational filters 
that would be able to recreate the desired final image? Yeah, that's a fun question. Okay, let me go back to, if I can, uh, the diagram that I was showing you earlier. Uh, here we go. Okay, so um, yeah, so what, what I interpret this question as is if some of the optics in your system are causing you problems, can you get rid of those optics and instead use a computer uh, to, to uh, get some of the information that you need instead? Um, and the answer is, in principle, uh, you could get pretty far uh, with that method. Um, so for those of you um, who uh, enjoy learning about the mathematical side of science, you might have heard something, uh, a term uh, called a Fourier transform. And that's a mathematical relationship that in the context of astronomy allows you to kind of relate um, two images, one where the light rays are parallel and then one when you've brought those light rays to a focus. And that's a very powerful relationship um, that you can certainly use um, in processing data, um, and you could you could use that in many ways. Um, you could also uh, imagine a, a world where you've trained, um, for example, some very fancy predictive um, algorithm um, to distinguish between starlight and planet light, and maybe remove the need for some lenses. Uh, maybe you could imagine some advanced optical system that gets away with um, fewer components or components that wouldn't introduce as many errors. Um, these are fruitful avenues, um, but because we have this array um, of sources of error in our adaptive optics system, this wouldn't get you as far as you would need to go to actually image Earth-like planets with large telescopes. So suppose we could remove all of these lenses from our system. That would get rid of that genre of errors, which is great, but we would still be left with these uh, time delay errors uh, with our sort of limited ability to uh, correct those distortions. Now you could say, what if I uh, didn't do any adaptive optics correction? What if I just saved all my data and I tried to use sort of fancy computer processing to after the fact, uh, try to distinguish a planet from the star? So the challenge there is that uh, when starlight has contaminated your image, as it does if you are not using adaptive optics or a coronagraph, um, there is a sort of a noise or a so source of error inherent with the arrival uh, times of those photons from the star. Um, and because of that sort of statistical nature um, and the noise associated with that statistical nature of the arrivals of photons from the star, um, you wouldn't be able to get around that source of noise. So this is why it's worth our while to actually correct the starlight and, and get it away from the planet light itself. All right, here's another one um, along those same lines. If it takes one millisecond to uh, set the wavefront sensor, why not delay the science light by one millisecond? the same time to bring both um, to be synchronized? Yeah, so, so this is a fun question um, that really gets at some, some great fundamental adaptive optics concepts. So imagine for a moment that I swapped the order of the wavefront sensor and the deformable mirror. So what if I first sent the distorted starlight to the wavefront sensor, I measured its shape, and then I sent it to the deformable mirror, whereas here it hits the deformable mirror first and then it goes to the wavefront sensor. Okay, so in this opposite day situation, uh, we could in principle say, okay, I measured this to be the wavefront sensor or to be the wavefront shape. Um, and now can I delay the light such that it uh, can't, you know, the atmosphere can't further evolve by the time that light encounters my deformable mirror or encounters um, the science detector. So in principle, you could create some kind of setup like this. Um, but the problem is that when your light encounters the wavefront sensor first and not the deformable mirror first, the wavefront sensor is encountering completely fresh, uncorrected turbulence every single time it takes an image. Whereas in the configuration that I've represented here, after the first few adaptive optics sort of loop iterations, it's really just seeing the small leftover changes that it wasn't able to correct the last time around. And it turns out that uh, running the system in what we call closed loop 
which is what I've shown here. It's where the wavefront sensor sort of sees the results of its blast correction and then makes a small change on top of that, that that works a whole lot better uh, with real atmospheric turbulence than what we would call open loop. That's if you had the wavefront sensor first. Um, so in principle, uh, there could be uh, ways to make progress uh, based on what you've described. Um, but because of this sort of open loop versus closed loop um, adaptive optics setups, uh, it would be very challenging to um, make that work in a stable way for science observations on sky. All right, uh, here are some shorter ones. Will the web telescope help? Can we do nothing with space telescopes? <laughs> um, there's plenty we can do with space telescopes. So uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, it operates at these uh, near infrared, so redder than red wavelengths. Um, and then even farther in the mid infrared and, and, and even out into the farther infrared. Um, that allows us to do science that we can't otherwise do. But what makes it a challenging fit for exoplanet imaging is if you if I go back to um, the size of the image I formed of a star. So I was saying it's the wavelength of observation divided by the diameter of the telescope. Because the James Webb Space Telescope uh, operates at long wavelengths, this first term, lambda, the wavelength, is going to be big. So automatically, uh, your image of the star is going to be bigger. You're not going to be able to see as close in uh, to image exoplanets. Also, the diameter D of that telescope is small um, compared to the largest telescopes we have on the ground. Um, so the sort of <laughs> your mental picture of the scaling of telescope sizes is very different in space versus the ground. So James Webb is tremendously exciting because it's a six and a half meter diameter telescope in space. But if you compare that to a ground-based telescope where we currently have a 10 meter telescope and we're making plans for 20 to 40 meter telescopes, it's also quite small. So both of these terms are working against you, the wavelength and the telescope diameter. Um, so that means we can't see very close into the star. Now, the second problem is that anytime you launch something um, into space, um, you have to be really sure that that technology is going to work. So usually you can't use the absolute bleeding edge technology. You have to use the technology that's a few years or, or sometimes more um, old. So for that reason, uh, we don't have all of the you know, most up-to-date, most state-of-the-art um, pieces of equipment that we would use for uh, wavefront control and, and starlight suppression with James Webb. So all that is just to say that James Webb is, is not necessarily the tool uh, that's going to get us to uh, Earth-like or uh, planet imaging. However, it's going to do a lot of other things that are going to be extremely fascinating. Um, so for example, observing planets like the ones that I showed you at the beginning of this talk um, at much longer wavelengths, um, that's going to give us a part of those planet spectrum that we've never seen before. Um, and it'll give us better um, signal compared to the noise um, of those planet spectrum that we've ever seen before. So it will give us very new pictures um, onto the contents of the atmospheres of exoplanets, but those won't be planets like the Earth. So it's an important piece of the puzzle in exoplanet science, but it's aimed at a little bit of a different slice of that science than what I've talked about here. All right, so speaking of bleeding edge technologies, I like this question. How about the option of having a second wavefront sensor and control loop to make a second level of adjustment and corrections of the wavefront? Well, that is a, is a question that I think might be tailor-made um, to speak to Ben's research. So if I go back to um, the slide that I was um, showing about this, that's actually exactly what uh, Ben and our group is doing. So um, when, here we go. So in this scheme, um, we have turned the um, science imager itself into a type of wavefront sensor. And so when Ben sees these interference fringes and uses those to reconstruct the shape of the wavefront and put a better correction onto the DM, that's exactly what we're doing. We have a whole second stage wavefront sensor. Now, uh, we don't have this on our test bed currently, um, but at some test beds and some observatories, uh, folks are actually introducing a whole additional deformable mirror um, to do that finer level of correction. 
Um, so for instance, at Keck Observatory, um, some of our colleagues down at Caltech have just installed a second deformable mirror to do exactly that. So that's a great question. And that is uh, where the technology has been leading us recently. All right. Um, now here are some uh, interferometry questions. Are there any plans to use an array of telescopes to better image these exoplanets? Yeah, so some of you might have seen in the news recently, um, there was a, a radio telescope interferometer that was used to take an image uh, to reconstruct an image of the material orbiting the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And that was really exciting. Um, and the, the answer to this question is, is both yes and no. Um, so uh, back in the 1990s um, and, and a bit later, um, the, the twin Keck telescopes, uh, there are two telescopes at Keck Observatory, they're both 10 meters wide, uh, were used uh, with a few additional um, smaller telescopes as an interferometer. Um, now, uh, the Keck telescopes aren't used in that way anymore, but um, in Arizona, there's a telescope called the Large Binocular Telescope, and it's two eight meter mirrors on the same mount. Um, and those two, two telescope mirrors are in fact used as an interferometer. So there, um, there are telescopes that do both exoplanet imaging and interferometry. Um, this is extremely challenging for many reasons. Um, one way to think about this is that uh, if you want to interfere um, the starlight, um, you have to be able to control, uh, for example, uh, the time delays of how that starlight is arriving at your detector. Um, and those sort of delays um, are related to a couple different things, but they're related to the wavelength of your observation. And so as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, so as you go from long uh, radio waves to shorter infrared and optical waves, interferometry becomes a harder and harder problem. So that's why you will often hear about um, radio telescope interferometers, but you don't hear quite as often about optical and infrared telescope interferometers. It's this challenge inherent to the wavelength of light involved. Um, so right now, um, there are not currently um, plans to build too many more interferometers at these wavelengths um, because of this challenge. Um, but um, an idea uh, that we've just been sort of discussing uh, amongst ourselves in the community um, is maybe that's something we should revive. Um, maybe on mountaintops where we have multiple telescopes, um, now that the technology has changed considerably in the intervening decades, uh, maybe this is something that should be revisited. Um, Back in the sort of 2000s and 2010s, um, there was a large effort at NASA to build a space interferometer. It was called SIM, the Space Interferometer Mission. Um, and that was based around this concept of light in space. Um, and ultimately it was determined that, that it was so challenging and complex that it wasn't um, worth continuing at that time. Um, but that, you know, there's, there will eventually be a limit uh, to how large of a single telescope we can build and interferometry is our way around that. So that's something I'd keep an eye on for the future. Good, and that, that answers one of the other questions. Of, yeah, what about uh, telescopes in space to be uh, in a number? So it's still expensive. Um, okay, uh, there is a question. I think this is about knowing interferometers, but I'll read the question. Have you tried using a diffraction grating in lieu of the Girard focusing self coherent camera technique to compensate for wavefront delay? And yeah, I think by that, um, they're asking about um, null and diffraction. Yeah, so, so this does, um, as you're saying, this does speak to um, a type of interferometry where uh, your goal is to deliberately introduce an offset um, to these wavefronts to try to uh, cancel out um, the starlight. Um, so that, that is absolutely something um, that, that is a part of this field. Um, at the large binocular telescope that I just mentioned um, over in Arizona, that's something that's been a very active area of development. Um, and in fact, uh, we we're fortunate to have, uh, I can find my mouse again. Uh, we we're fortunate to have uh, here at UC Santa Cruz an alumni uh, who was a leader in that group, uh, Phil Hins. Here we go. 
who was really one of the pioneers of this milling interferometry technique. Um, so uh, yeah, I would keep an eye on this technology in the future and, and it's something that, that is being implemented and has been implemented. Okay, I waited long enough. Let's do, I get to some science questions. Our solar system planets look like outliers compared to the others in the separation versus planet mass plot. Since we're more likely to see the larger planets with current methods, well, I think that's um, referring to exoplanet imaging, for example, the distribution of larger planets appears uh, to be in favor of uh, detecting them. How, however, how would uh, how would this plot look different if plotted by stellar class, for mm. example, or our G class? Um, in other words, uh, do different stellar types uh, are they more likely, or uh, sometimes more likely, to have planets uh, than others? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that a lot of the patterns and the structure that you see on this figure are purely based on what is easy or versus hard for us to detect. So the fact that there aren't many points on this plot at the location of our solar system planets, that's just because our techniques have a hard time <laughs> detecting those regions of mass separation parameter space. So I, I would start with that. Um, we don't actually know what these distributions exactly would look like. But to answer the second part of your question, um, yes, so the Kepler Space Telescope, um, which was a space-based telescope that searched for transiting exoplanets for many years, um, it told us a lot about um, how the distribution of exoplanets is different between uh, stars of different spectral types or stars of different masses and temperatures. And so the the one of the big results that they found is that smaller stars than the sun, so stars that are cooler, redder, lower mass, tend to host uh, uh, low mass planets. So Earth size are smaller, and they tend to host these in large numbers. Um, whereas if you look at hotter, more massive stars, uh, we don't typically see the same abundances of planets around those stars. And that, that conclusion is not without observational biases of its own, but, but that's the direction that we're starting to think about. Um, but one result from Kepler and, and other uh, radial velocity or Doppler studies has been that if you were to consider solar type and lower mass stars, there's likely uh, about one planet per star on average. So uh, that's something that I like to think about. If you look at the night sky, um, a lot, the, a lot of those stars that you're seeing um, have planets around them, and we now know that in a statistically rigorous way. All right, another question about this plot. Um, people are noticing uh, there seems to be three or four clusters. So uh, as you mentioned, observational bias. Uh, is this correct, or uh, why are these clusters there? Yeah, so it, um, the, the answer is both yes and no to that. So some of the clustering effects that you see are due to observational biases, and, and others um, seem to be real. Um, so for example, there are some regions of parameter space that are not as densely populated as others. Um, and uh, this led to an interesting discovery. This is also using Kepler transiting planet data. Uh, which is that planets do sometimes tend to occur more often, for example, at certain masses compared to other masses. And sometimes there are kind of gaps um, where planets don't seem to be as common. And you can relate this back to what we understand of how planets form. So um, it could be that planets can form in one of several ways. Um, it could be that a very small planet forms uh, sort of via accreting or having um, uh, pieces of, of rock or harder material form over time, um, and that can grow a very small planet. Um, for other planets, they can grow uh, to have a very large core, which can then uh, gravitationally attract a great deal of gas and form gas giants. Um, but there are in-between times in these different formation scenarios where it could be that there's sort of an unstable equilibrium that's likely to push you more in the direction of a small planet versus more in the direction of a large planet. And that's where some of those gaps become real and, and really become indicative of planet formation. All right. And also on this plot, uh, 
Um, will it be possible to distinguish between Venus and Earth-like planets? Yeah, this figure looks like uh, they're right on top of each other. Yeah, I mean, Venus is often referred to as Earth's twin, um, and there's a good reason for that there. Mass and there, how far they are from the sun um, is quite similar. Um, and this question gets at a really um, challenging problem in astronomy, which is um, how will we know which planets are favorable for hosting life? Because of course, Venus, uh, it's extremely hot. Uh, it has very high atmospheric pressures, and so it's quite inhospitable. Whether, whereas Earth, it's almost exactly the same size, just a little bit farther from the sun and Earth is very hospitable. So how are we gonna tell the difference? Um, oftentimes you'll hear astronomers talk in very general terms about something called the habitable zone. And that's just the region around the star where you might conclude that temperatures would be um, temperate enough for liquid water to persist on that planet's surface. Um, but, that doesn't make uh, too many assumptions about the atmosphere of that planet. So there are different definitions of the habitable zone, but oftentimes the habitable zone would include Venus, Earth, and Mars. And as we know, only one out of those three um, is hospitable. So that brings us back to the power of direct imaging. We may never know um, just from measuring the mass and separation of a planet, whether it's like Venus or whether it's like Earth. It's taking the spectrum of that planet that's going to give you the information that you need. And that's why I wanted to share with you this figure of what a spectrum of the Earth would look like. This has an abundance of features that we could identify as being indicative of life. It's got the water, it's got the oxygen, et cetera. Venus's spectrum would look totally different. And so if we can directly image these planets and disperse their light into a spectrum, that's how we can understand um, how a Venus and Earth would be different. All right, and then looking at this figure, I was sort of speculating um, uh, if the data looks like this figure, what happens next when we find Earth-like planets? Yeah, so uh, there will come a day, I hope sooner rather than later, that we will have a spectrum of, of another planet where we see exciting features and where astronomers will start to say, I think this is a water feature. I think this is an oxygen feature. So the debate um, that I would predict will happen at that point uh, will be sort of number one, uh, if different astronomers from different groups around the world sort of start out with the same data, are they, do they identify these same features? Um, so does everyone from the same starting point agree that, for example, that you see a, a feature based on water or oxygen? So that's point number one. Point number two will be to say, okay, I see these features, but do they require life in order to be explained? Or could they be explained by some, what we call an abiotic process? So some natural process that just has nothing to do with life. Um, and right now that's a very active area of research is people are trying to say, all right, can I dream up some scenario um, where some you know, abiotic process could produce you know, oxygen or nitrogen or ozone or, or any of those other um, factors that we associate with life, um, but without the presence of life. So that interpretation is going to be a subject of debate. Um, so that those are those would be the immediate next steps. All right, there are uh, some more questions, but I want to be aware of time. Um, you can ask the uh, organizers if now would be a good time to do the backward. Should I ask a few more? We can go on a few more minutes. Go ahead. A few more minutes. All right. Um, back to technology. I like this one. That helps clarify the stage. How far do you move the mirrors? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, um, how how much like how big of a range of motion you need on the mirror um, depends on a few things. Um, it depends on sort of where you put your telescope um, and that um, informs like just how turbulent of an atmosphere do you contend with. Um, and it also has to do with how big your telescope is. So um, with today's telescopes, we need on the order of uh, sort of micrometers of motion. And with larger telescopes, we need to increase that value. We need to get more in the neighborhood of tens of micrometers. Um, so that's a, an area of technology development 
um, right now. Um, we call that um, the deformable mirror stroke. So you know, how much offset can it introduce? Um, and you can uh, sort of derive that based on our understanding of uh, the statistics of atmospheric turbulence. Uh, and this is uh, next question is good looking at this image. Um, that people were asking, uh, what is the, can you estimate the signal to noise ratio that you need, um, you know, for whether uh, claiming these planets are detected? Um, and uh, I don't know, I think uh, some people are also thinking in decibels um, for contrast. So uh, if it maybe helps to just explain the logarithmic scale of uh, contrast and some of the contrast plots. Yeah, yeah. So let me go back to the one that I was showing uh, over here when we were talking about predictive control. Um, so uh, actually, let me go back even farther. So uh, when you think about uh, when you look up at the night sky and you're observing stars of different brightnesses, um, your eyes don't respond um, in a linear way to the amount of flux that they're seeing. So if you look at a star, two stars, one of which is twice as bright as the other, they don't appear twice as bright to your eyes. Our eyes operate um, on something more similar to a logarithmic scale. And so that's why the um, ancient Greeks, um, they initially defined a brightness scale that we call um, the magnitude system. Um, so if anyone here is um, interested in, in an amateur astronomy, you've probably heard, you know, oh, this is a sixth magnitude star. This is a fourth magnitude star. That goes back to that ancient Greek system of magnitudes that's based on how our eyes respond to light. Um, it's convenient for us uh, to express the contrast ratio of the planet to the star that we're able to detect in a similar way. And so the um, y-axis of this plot here is shown um, in this logarithmic scale and also in scientific notation. So that's why it's shown as you know, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two um, up here. So, um, so this is just a different way that helps us express um, these very large differences um, that we see across a region of parameter space that we're interested in. Uh, but actually, let me let me go back to that signal to noise question. So this idea of sort of what constitutes a high enough signal to noise um, image of a planet, um, that's actually something that, that astronomers like to argue about, myself included, um, amongst ourselves. Because if I go back to this image that I was showing you here, um, there's a lot more sort of noise or, or air being introduced by light leaking out from behind our chronograph close to the star than there is far away. So you have to be very careful about taking that into account and making sure that uh, you're not letting one of those little artifacts fool you um, close to the star and, and making you think it's a planet. Okay, I think uh, we should probably leave it there. Um... Thank you everyone for all your excellent questions. Uh, I'll maybe try and answer a few more just uh, in Q&A, but I'll hang on the back. Well, thank you, Professor uh, Dr. Gerard, and thank you, Professor Jensen Clem for a fascinating uh, le lecture tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll be taking a break over the summer, but we look forward to seeing you again in the fall. Good night, everyone.